right? So uh, this nice photo of uh, Noga and Janos uh, was made in, uh, Mo in Moscow, a Moscow workshop on combinatorics and number theory, uh, as far as I remember, in 2014. And uh, so it's uh, really a very great pleasure to introduce uh, the talk of uh, Noga Alon on this seminar. Uh, of course, everyone knows Noga for his outstanding contributions to a uh, wide range of uh, fields in combinatorics and computer science. And uh, honestly, uh, let me say Noga is one of the founders of uh, probabilistic method in combinatorics and he laid the foundations of uh, modern theoretical computer science. Uh, Noga, please, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And also for the nice photo, uh, I didn't know that you are going to show this one. Uh, actually, you cannot see in the photo, but it was uh, uh, this was January. It was a uh, minus twenty five centigrade, and actually I came from Tel Aviv, and in Tel Aviv it was plus twenty, and uh, and you know it's a pretty short flight, so. Uh, so this was a, uh, but uh, Moscow was a really uh, beautiful. So uh, let me try to share my screen. Good, so, uh, so it's a, a pleasure to uh, take the a baton from uh, Annika in London, and uh, I'll try to pass it to Lazzi in Budapest uh, in some uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. And uh, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, about splitting random necklaces. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Dor Elboy uh, from Princeton, uh, uh, Janusz Bach uh, from Budapest and Moscow, and Gabor Tardos uh, from Budapest. And uh, as you can see, the young co-author here is the most uh, active one. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll talk uh, mainly about random necklaces, uh, but I want to start with some brief introduction about the uh, deterministic uh, case. And, uh, uh, and actually, uh, let me even start uh, earlier with some early motivation. Uh, uh, so some of the earliest uh, results about uh, splitting an object uh, according to several uh, measures, uh, fairly, uh, were considered by uh, Steinhaus. Uh, you see here Steinhaus. Uh, he considered in the 30s and 40s uh, some cake cutting problems, and, uh, and maybe even uh, better known is the ham sandwich theorem, which he suggested and was uh, uh, proved by uh, uh, Banach. Uh, here you see a ham sandwich and you see Banach. Uh, and this says that uh, whenever you have a, a D nice uh, probability measure, so let's say uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the big measure in RD, then you can uh, have all of them with one hyperplane. So Steinhaus uh, asked it uh, for dimension three. And, uh, and here you see how one hyperplane uh, has the uh, two slices of bread and the meat in a ham sandwich. Uh, he actually, in his formulation, uh, it was about uh, cutting with a meat cutter, uh, the bone, the meat, and the fat of a ham sandwich. And, uh, uh, and he asked if this can be done. And in his paper in uh, 1938, he mentioned that this was uh, solved by Banach by reducing it uh, to the borsuk ulam theorem. Uh, explicitly, uh, this was uh, mentioned in the paper just for dimension three, but basically the same proof works for any dimension, uh, uh, though uh, uh, it appeared for any dimension only a few years uh, later. Uh, in a paper by a Stone and a, a Taki. And, a, and there has been a, lots and lots of a, extensions and generalizations and modifications of these. Uh, 
And uh, there is actually a nice uh, a recent uh, survey by Edgardo Roldan Pensado and Pablo Sobron. And this is a survey of mass partitions. It's a uh, focusing on the uh, questions with a geometric flavor. And uh, today we'll be interested uh, in a, a more a discrete or combinatorial example. And that's a, a necklace theorem. So here I state it for k equals two. For k equals two in a continuous version, it was uh, proved already in the 60s by Hobby and Rice, uh, motivated by question in approximation theory. And uh, in the version it appears here, uh, it was first uh, proved by Goldberg and West. And uh, there is a very short proof uh, using the uh, Bosley Ulam theorem or the Ham Sandwich theorem. And the statement is that whenever we have an open necklace, so this is just an interval of beads, like uh, the ones that you see in the picture here, with two AI beads of type I for I between one and T, so T types, and we have an even number of beads of each type, then it is always possible to cut this necklace in at most T places, and partition the resulting intervals into two collections, each containing exactly a fair share, maybe exactly AI beads of type I for every I. And here you see an example with two types of beads, say uh, the red ones and the uh, green ones, uh, maybe rubies and uh, sapphires uh, if you want. And uh, we have here two cuts, and you see that the two cuts enable us to give the middle interval uh, to put it in one collection, and the two uh, extreme ones in the other collection, and then uh, each of them contains uh, exactly three green beads and exactly four red beads. And the claim is that uh, we can always do it. And uh, there is a more general statement that works for a, a K collection. So if we have again an open necklace with K and I beads of type I now, a T types, and we want K collections, then it is always possible to cut the necklace in most K minus one times T places and partition the resulting intervals into K collections each containing exactly AI beads of type I for all I between one and T. And one way to think about it or to remember it is that uh, we think about these K thieves that stole together a necklace and uh, they are maybe mathematically oriented thieves and they want to partition it fairly among themselves. And uh, this says that if there are T types of beads. They can always do it by at most K minus one times T cuts, say, uh, so that the number of beads say, will be exactly equal in each type for each of them if it's divisible by K. And if not, then uh, uh, it will differ by at most one. And it's easy to see that this is tied for all K and T because if like uh, uh, the examples that you see in the uh, picture here, the beads of each type appear contiguously on the necklace, then just to cut each type into K non-empty collections, uh, you need K minus one cuts inside the interval of each type. And that gives together K minus one times T cuts. So the statement is that it can always be done uh, with at most k minus one t cuts, even if the necklace is very complicated. Okay. And uh, uh, I wrote here something about the stacks of proof because I want to say something about the algorithmic aspects. Uh, so there are two easy stacks. Uh, one of them is combinatorial, uh, and it says that the validity of the statement for a group of k1 thieves and the group of k2 thieves implies its validity for K1, K2, and that's easy to prove. And the other one is also not too difficult. And this is to transform the question into a continuous one by uh, changing the necklace 
to an interval colored by T colors. So we replace every bead by a small interval colored by the corresponding color. And this defines a T probability measures on the interval. And then we prove something about splitting fairly the T probability measures using not too many cuts. And this is indeed the main step. So this is topological. It uses a fixed point theorem uh, in the original proof of a, a uh, it uses a fixed point theorem of a Baran, Schlossmann, and Such, which is a, an extension of a, uh, the Borsu-Coulomb theorem. And, a, uh, and this is good enough to prove the continuous statement for prime values k. And therefore, the first step is uh, lucky because uh, we need to prove it only for primes in order to know it uh, for, a, uh, for everything. Okay, so this is uh, how it goes. And uh, this topological uh, part is not constructive in the sense that uh, it does not provide an efficient algorithm. Uh, so uh, yeah, but uh, uh, maybe first I uh, show here that uh, there are uh, some YouTube presentations uh, talking about some aspects of uh, of this uh, proof. So you can uh, uh, look uh, uh, in uh, any of them uh, to see more uh, about the proof. Uh, and uh, and here is a uh, a natural algorithm question. Uh, and this is a, so given such an input necklace with T types uh, and K I bits of type I, we know that there are always K minus one times T cuts that enable us to split it fairly. Can we actually find these cuts efficiently for a given uh, input necklace? And uh, uh, I was interested in this question uh, for quite some time. Uh, I uh, mentioned it uh, already uh, sometime in the uh, uh, early 90s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think it's interesting, even if you don't care much about the algorithm, because this somehow checks uh, how essential the topology is here. Because somehow the feeling is that if you find a combinatorial proof, then maybe it's more likely to give also an efficient algorithm. And uh, uh, there is a, uh, the following uh, recent uh, remarkable uh, result by Aris Chilos uh, Ratsikas and uh, Paul Goldberg. So what they showed is that uh, this algorithm problem is probably difficult. Uh, let's talk about K equals two, so just two things. Uh, and we have this uh, necklace, uh, we know that there is always a splitting with T cuts, say this is the case when K is two. And the problem of finding actually the cuts is what is called PPA complete. So I don't want to talk much about complexity classes. PPA is a complexity class introduced by Christos Papadimitriou. And it deals with a uh, complete MP problems with problems that always have a solutions and we wonder how difficult it is to find a solution. So as is always the case in complexity theory, we don't know to prove hardness say, for any natural problem, but we are pretty good in proving reduction, namely showing that some problems are as hard as some other problems. In saying that this problem is PPA complete, it says that uh, it belongs to the class PPA, and also that it is as hard as any other problem. So at least as hard as any other problem in this class. And we don't know an efficient uh, uh, algorithm for solving uh, any of the problems in this class. Uh, so uh, this is an indication that probably this is a hard problem. And one more comment about the uh, algorithm before I uh, move to, a, uh, to random necklaces uh, is at least uh, raises uh, maybe a natural question of what can we do efficiently if we allow to have elite, uh, to increase the number of cuts. 
by a little bit. And, uh, and in fact, the hardness result applies even if the number of cuts is a little bit more than t, t plus t to the one minus delta. And uh, what we uh, could show with uh, Andre Grauer, who was a student in Princeton and now is a student in Stanford, uh, uh, is that uh, this necklace having problem, this is the case k equals two, with uh, beads of t types, and at most m beads of each type, can be solved efficiently using most t times log m roughly cuts. So it's significantly more than t, but uh, uh, still it's much less than the length of the uh, necklace. And, uh, and this is the best uh, algorithm that we uh, know now. It is based on some uh, geometric considerations. So uh, let me now uh, move to uh, the main part of lecture. And, uh, and this is the case of the uh, uh, random necklaces. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, this is a, a joint uh, work with uh, uh, Elvoy and uh, Pach and Tardosh. Uh, and, uh, 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 and in some sense, it's still in progress, uh, but, uh, uh, but it seems uh, uh, we are uh, pretty close to having a, a paper uh, ready. So, uh, so this is the picture, but let me uh, be more formal and give you a, the actual uh, random uh, model. So here is a random model we want to consider. The number of collections will be k, namely we have this k fifth to uh, try to uh, partition the necklace fairly among them. The number of types will be t, and the number of beads of each type will be k times n. So altogether, we have k times m times t beads, exactly km of each type, and each thief, if you want, or each collection should contain exactly m beads of each type. Uh, now the open necklace is random, so it is a uniform random permutation of these beads. We have these n beads, we take a uniform random permutation of them, and let's denote by x of n, this is the minimum number of cuts that suffice to generate a partition into k collections, each containing exactly m bits of each time. So, uh, so this xm, yeah, I, I don't know actually if you can see my mouse here. Uh, yes, we can, we can. Yes, yeah. you can, uh, okay, good. So, so this uh, x, which is a function of k, t, and m, and I mentioned several times uh, uh, in the sequel again, what is k, what is t, and what is m. So, uh, uh, so this is a random variable, of course, and we want to know what is its typical value, and we will be interested in the asymptotics. So, at least one of the variables, uh, and sometimes maybe two of them, uh, will tend to infinity. So, uh, so we know that this random variable is never more than k minus one times t, right? This was a deterministic result, but maybe it is typically much smaller for the random case. So, so let me mention uh, some of the results uh, in the uh, paper with the Dor Elboy, Janusz Pach, and the uh, uh, Gabor Tardos. Uh, uh, so here is the first result, is that uh, this is with fixed k and t, so fixed number of thieves and fixed number of types in the large m, so a long necklace, the number of beads of each type, which is k times m, is big, hence infinity. Then uh, with high probability, so <clears throat> whenever I say with high probability, I mean with probability that tends to one is m tends to infinity. This random variable is at least k minus one times t plus one over two. So remember that the deterministic result tells us that it is never more than k minus one times t. So what we have here is a, 
roughly half of a, a little bit more than half of a, is a lower bound with high probability. And uh, that's actually not too difficult to prove. It's a first moment argument. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, the result gives it the probability that a smaller number of cuts suffices. Uh, so a smaller number s, which is less than k minus one times t plus one over two cuts suffice, then the probability is a negative power of m. It's m to the s minus this k minus one t plus one over two. So for s that is smaller than this uh, quantity, this is a negative power of m. And one can also prove that this is a correct uh, behavior namely this holds as a lower bound as well. So for this, you have to uh, work a little bit, but, uh, uh, but this is uh, uh, the situation uh, for the lower bound. Now here is a, a special case. I wrote it here as theorem A and B. Suppose K is two now. So we have two fits or two collection. Then this lower bound K minus one times T plus one over two is t plus one over two, right? Uh, k is two, so k minus one is one. And then uh, if t is odd, then the lower bound tells us that always we need at least, uh, or with high probability, we need at least t plus one over two cuts. t plus one over two is an integer we may wonder what is the probability that t plus one over two cuts suffice. It turns out that this is still very low as m is very big, but on the other hand, it's much bigger than the situation for a smaller number of cuts. Namely, this behaves both upper and lower bound as constant one over log m. Okay, so it goes to zero with m, but uh, goes uh, slowly. Uh, now let me call a partition of the positions of the beads balance if each part contains the right number of beads. So each part contains exactly t times m beads. Uh, we consider only such uh, partitions. And let's call the partition fair if indeed each part contains the right number of beads of each type, and the exactly n beads of each type. And then uh, again, let's talk about k equals two, two thieves. Uh, the expected number of fair partitions using s cuts, and now I'm thinking about s, which is bigger than t plus one over two, because we already dealt with the case that s is most t plus one over two. Then the expected number of fair partitions by S cuts is what is written here. Namely, uh, it's some constant uh, depending on uh, S and T, M to the S minus T plus one over two. This is just you count the number of balanced partitions, which is essentially M to the S minus one. And then you multiply by the probability that one balanced partition will be fair which is a one over M to the T minus one over two. And uh, uh, so this will be the expected number of fair partition. And note that this expected number, so for S equals T plus one over two, this is a constant. And we already said that then the probability of getting actually a fair partition behaves like one over log M. But if S is bigger, even if it's T plus one over two plus one, then this expected number is big, right? So it is a, a maybe m, a, if t plus one over two was an integer, and for bigger s, a, it's a m square. So for a while, uh, we thought, I mean, it makes sense to think that maybe when the expected number of fair partitions is very big, then we expect to get at least one fair partition, and then s cuts will suffice, so for a while we suspected uh, that maybe t plus one over two plus one cuts will be enough with high probability, with probability that tends to a uh, to one is uh, m tends to infinity. 
And it was a, a somewhat surprising uh, uh, to prove the following, that in fact, for any fixed S bigger than T plus one over two, and at most T, remember that T cuts always suffice for two thieves. So the relevant uh, numbers are only up to T. And actually each specific number of cuts say, here is obtained with probability bounded away from zero and one. And there is a probability that for two thieves P types, you need S cut or S is the minimum number of cuts to get a, 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 a fair partition is bounded away from zero by some function of S and T. So anything uh, uh, is possible uh, up to T. And uh, let me also uh, mention that uh, uh, in the other extreme case, when the fair share of each part of each thief is only one big of each type, namely this corresponds to the case that M is one, we have exactly K bits of each type, then the number of required cuts may be much smaller than the deterministic lower bound, which is k minus one times c. And, uh, and this is another result that uh, if the parameters uh, tend to infinity in the way that I wrote here, the number of types and the number of thieves divided by log the number of types both tend to infinity, but m is one, each thief should get only one bit of each type, then the number of cuts is little o of kt with high probability, right? So the deterministic result here is k minus one times c. Now both k and t are big, so, uh, so it's roughly k times t, but with high probability for this, for a random necklace here, we need little o of kt. Yes, so, uh, so I don't know if we are postponing questions to the end, but if, uh, but if you really have a, a, an urgent question, uh, then it's fine to also uh, ask uh, uh, during the lecture. Uh, and what I want uh, to do in some uh, uh, roughly 15 minutes at our length is to tell you something about the uh, proofs. Uh, so the whole proofs are pretty technical and they uh, will uh, not be able to uh, describe them, but, uh, but I want to show uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, two ideas and, uh, uh, and sketch uh, uh, proofs of some uh, special cases of uh, the results. So, uh, so here is the uh, first thing that I want to show is, uh, so this is a special case of what I quoted is a theorem A and B, and in this special case, how the computation is simpler. So two thieves and three types large M. We want to have two collections, we have three types, and we have a exactly two times M bits of each type. So the random variable now is called X two three M. Well, the probability that one cut is enough is kind of trivial. We have an interval of leads. Altogether, there are six M bids here, right? Two M of each of the three types. There is only one way to cut it into two parts of three M bids by one cut. We have to cut in the middle. And the probability is that this will be balanced, will have exactly the same number of bids of each type. It's easy to compute exactly, and the asymptotics of this behaves like one over M. And so I didn't bother to write the constant. Okay. So one cut suffices with probability one over M. Uh, two cuts suffice with probability constant over log M. So that will be the things that I'll try to sketch the proof of. And three cuts say uh, always suffice by the deterministic result. Right, because the number of types is three and k is two. So uh, when k is two, t cuts always suffice. So the statement uh, to prove here really is that two cuts suffice with probability constant over log n. And I want to 
say something about the proof of field say, because I think it has some uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, idea. So again, uh, I repeat it here on this picture of the necklace, two fifths, three types, large M. The number of cuts that we need is one is very low probability, two is probability essentially one over log M, three with the remaining probability. And, uh, and I want to uh, sketch the proof of this. And as I already said, the only interesting thing to prove is that the probability that two cuts suffice behaves like one over log M. Okay. So the necklace here is an interval of six M beads. Two M of them are red, two M are blue, and two M are green, right? Rubies, diamonds, and sapphires, if you want. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's convenient here to view the necklace as a closed one. If you think about it, when you are going to use two cuts, it doesn't really matter if you opened it or closed it because uh, the two cuts are doing the same to the open necklace and to the closed necklace. So let me view it as a closed necklace. And let me call a cyclic interval of three M beads, the right number of beads that uh, one thief should get. We call it fair if it contains exactly M beads of each type. Now, this is the case, even only if it contains the right number of beads of uh, two of the columns, let's say the right number of red beads, M red beads and M blue beads, because since the total length is 3M, then it will have also the right number of uh, green beads. Okay, so this is a, a fair interval. And uh, we define a random variable which will be the number of fair intervals of length 3M in the necklace. So what we really want to understand uh, uh, is when this random variable is positive. What is the probability that this random variable is positive? So we can compute the expectation of this random variable and the expectation of the square of it. And both of them are not too difficult to compute. Let me avoid the uh, uh, computation. But it turns out that the expectation of y, namely the expected number of fair intervals, uh, intervals of length 3M that contain the right number of beads of each type is a constant. And the expectation of the square of it is some constant uh, times log M. And because of this, by the pali zygmunt uh, inequality, uh, uh, or if you want, by a similar inequality of uh, Erdős and Chang, uh, uh, they are all uh, very old results. Uh, the probability that y is positive is at least expectation square divided by the expectation of the square. And this gives us a lower bound, which is one over log m, which is what I wanted to prove uh, uh, up to a constant for a lower bound and the upper bound. So, uh, so the lower bound is just pali sigmund and some computation uh, uh, which is omitted. Uh, uh, the upper bound is uh, uh, more interesting and, uh, and here is the idea. So we will define another random variable, Z. And uh, what we will show is that uh, if Y is positive, then Z also tends to be positive. And on the other hand, we will be able to show that Z is positive with very low probability, with probability one over log A. So, so here is this uh, random variable Z defined on necklaces. It is a number of fair intervals so that no interval obtained from the fair interval I by shifting it at most M to the quarter beads clockwise is fair. Okay, so uh, so we'll soon uh, have a picture of this. Uh, now notice that, uh, as I said, the expectation of Y is only constant. And therefore the probability is that Y, the number of fair intervals exceeds M to the three quarters say, is only constant M to the minus three quarters, just by Markov's inequality. And therefore, 
if y is positive, then with very high probability, z is also positive because if y is positive, we have a fair interval, but z is not positive. So it means that if we shift clockwise at most n to the one quarter, we will find a, a, another fair interval. And then if we shift another m to the one quarters clockwise, we'll find way yet another one and so on. And we can do it m to the three quarters times. So it means that if y is a uh, positive, but z is zero, then y has to be very, very big. But this happens with very low probability. So that means that if y is positive, then with high probability, z is also positive. Uh, therefore, it suffices to show that the probability that z is positive is only a constant over log m. And, uh, and this is proved by realizing that what is happening here is very similar to what is happening in a two-dimensional random walk. So basically, we apply a modified version, if you want, of the classical argument of uh, Dvoretsky and Erdes. It has been improved uh, uh, many times uh, uh, if we care about the error terms, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which gives us the probability that the standard two-dimensional random walk starting from the origin does not visit the origin for s steps. So we know that this goes to zero with uh, high probability as s increases because the random walk is recurrent, but actually the correct behavior is constant one over log s. And the relevant random walk here is the following. So if we have an interval, when we shift it by one clockwise, the vector of the numbers of red and blue beads it contains can change by what is written here. Either it doesn't change or the number of red beads decreases by one and the number of blue beads say, does not change uh, and so on. So there are all these say uh, seven possibilities uh, that are with the probabilities uh, that appear here. And, uh, and this is nearly independent for a sequence of m to the one quarter steps. So it's not quite independent because we know exactly the total number of beads of each type, but it's nearly independent. So let me just show it uh, by a picture. If we have this, necklace that we see here, and we shift it, as you see in this picture, so again, uh, then you see that the vector of red blue changes by one zero, right? The number of red beads increases by one, the number of blue beads does not increase. So this is a, a, some sort of random a, a walk, and because it is symmetric, so it's uh, similar enough to a usual random walk, and therefore, by this uh, uh, classical uh, argument, uh, one can show that the probability that uh, z is positive, uh, because this is exactly the probability that the random walk will not return to the origin, again, starting from the origin, uh, for m to the one quarter steps, behaves like one over the log of it, which is one over log n. So maybe uh, this was a, a little bit too fast, but, uh, but I think at least you can uh, understand the uh, flavor uh, of things. Uh, so why is positive with probability constant over log m? Because it's basically the same probability that c is positive, and that gives us the uh, probabilities that two cuts suffice. Now, I thought that I uh, could possibly have time uh, for proving uh, uh, the other uh, results that, uh, one of the other results that I mentioned, that for t and k over log t big when m is one, then the number of cuts is only little of kt with high probability, but it seems that I not have time for this. So let me just mention that it uses some of the results about the chromatic index of nearly regular uniform hypergraphs with small codegrees. And uh, uh, 
I'll uh, uh, not show uh, anything uh, of the details. Uh, uh, so there is some complication and then there is some reduction to this type of results. Uh, let, let me just uh, finish by, uh, so this is uh, kind of the uh, proof. And let me just uh, finish uh, mentioning two open problems. Uh, so the first one is, uh, I said this uh, algorithmic version of the necklace uh, theorem is what is called PPA hard. So there is some indication that it's hard in the worst case. And one may wonder if it is easier for random instances, namely if the proofs for the random case would provide any good algorithm, actually uh, we don't know to do it. And, uh, and in fact, we do not know to use the fact that the necklace in, is random and to show that in that case, uh, K minus one times T cuts are enough with high probability, right? It is true with probability one because of the deterministic result, but we know it only because of the deterministic result not because of say uh, random necklaces. Here is one other question that I wanted to mention. Uh, so that's a very special case, which looks interesting. You have two thieves, one, uh, the fair share of each thief of each type is one, namely two bits of each type, T types, okay? So we have a necklace of length two T, two bits of each type, we have to cut it and distribute it to two collections, each containing exactly one bit of each type. Well, you can use here a, a, some a martingale inequalities to show that here with high probability, the minimum number of cuts you need is within distance essentially square root t of the expectation with high probability. So we want to know the expectation. It's not difficult to show that the expectation is at least 0.22t minus little of t. Uh, there is a slightly more sophisticated argu uh, argument, and this was together with uh, Ryan Elwise, uh, Colin Defant, and Noah Kravitz. Uh, uh, we showed that it is at most 0.40t minus little of t with high probability. Both the upper bound and the lower bound can be slightly improved, so maybe in the, uh, by another 0.01t. But there is still quite some gap between the upper and lower bound. So we don't know what the truth is, but even more basic, we don't know to prove that the limit of the ratio of the expectation of the number of cuts needed divided by t as t tends to infinity exists. I mean, of course it exists. There is no way that this limit does not exist, but we don't know uh, to prove it. And, uh, uh, and this will be interesting. Uh, and if it exists, then it will be interesting uh, maybe to know what is the value. This I think is probably pretty hard. And, uh, and one cannot, it's pretty difficult to try a simulation here because the problem of finding the minimum number of cuts, even in a necklace with just two beads of each type, this problem is known to be NP hard. So, uh, so we cannot really simulate it. Uh, for large T, but it will be, uh, so as I said, I believe that finding the right constant should be difficult. Proving the ratio maybe is not so difficult and maybe we are just uh, missing something simple, but we don't know to uh, show it. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I'll finish uh, and thank you all for uh, listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Noga. Does anyone have questions? questions? Uh, I have one short question. Um, so, for the especially for the case when m tends to infinity, is it essentially the same to generate random necklaces by uh, not, not in the model where the number of, number of bits is fixed, but uh, assigning colors with uh, probability one over the number of beads and then asking for an almost uh, partition. Okay, so I, I'm not, I mean, some of the question I didn't uh, hear, but I think you asked uh, if it's not, uh, it's not so, so essential that the number of beads of each type will be exactly to M, 
you just wanted to take randomly every bid to be uh, of every type with probability one over the number of types and ask about- G, G, G of NP instead of G of NM. That's right, yeah. So, so that will be essentially the same. I mean, of course, then the number of bids will not be divisible by what you want, but then you ask about uh, getting a partition that is equal within one and, uh, and everything yeah. uh, will, work to, will work in the same way. And, uh, and actually maybe this, uh, we, we thought a little bit about uh, this model. It seems that the two models are basically the same. In this model, there is some description of it, uh, which can be uh, given in terms of folding a random walk in a t-dimensional Euclidean space so that the end of it will be very close to the origin. So let me not say exactly what this means, mm -hmm. but you can probably guess. And maybe this shows why there is some connection to random walks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mother. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Noga. Um, so you brought up the possibility of a connection between combinatorial problems that have topological proofs, especially proofs from fixed point theorems, and being a, a PPA complete. Um, are there other examples of this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so there are a few other examples. Say, they are all pretty similar to the say necklace uh, theorem. So uh, one of them is a relate a version of the cycle plus triangles uh, theorem. Uh, uh, so I will not describe it, but some of the people heard know it. Uh, I know and, what you mean, uh, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and this specific problem actually is not known to be PPA hard, but, uh, mm -hmm. but some extension of it uh, that we have in some recent paper is known to be PPA hard. And some other problems is some, uh, uh, are some epsilon consensus uh, problem for, uh, uh, for measures uh, on an interval. Uh, I would say that the, uh, most of these are pretty similar to the uh, necklace theorem. Uh, and these are, uh, all of these are results that are proved uh, by topological means. Uh, the cycle plus triangles thing has also an algebraic proof. And uh, using the most on yes. Uh, that's right. And, and maybe this is the reason that it's hard to prove it is PPA hard, because if something has more proofs, then it's harder to prove that it's hard because it would imply that all these proof techniques are, are PPA hard. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we are nearly out of time. So maybe a very short question if anyone has. All right, no short questions, only long questions remain. So if you have one, you can, I think, ask Noga in chat. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Noga.